Last week, to avoid waiting in line, I thought, well, I know what I'll do. I'll call the Social Security Administration and make an appointment to meet with someone in person. So I dialed the number, and yeah, you guessed it, I got put on hold. And then a recording came on and said, the approximate time of your wait before you'll be able to speak to a representative is 55 minutes. I don't like waiting, you don't like waiting, and yet the church sets apart a season every year where you and I are encouraged to celebrate the act of waiting. It's called Advent, and it begins today. And Advent means waiting, which begs the question, okay? Then what is it exactly that you and I are waiting for? Now, if I pull 10 of you out of the pews and ask you that question, probably nine or maybe even 10 of you would say, we're waiting for Christmas. No, we're not. Christmas already occurred nearly 2,000 years ago. The historic fact that Almighty God actually entered into time and space at a particular place and took on human flesh in the person of Jesus Christ, that is history. Now, what we're waiting for is the second coming of Christ. That's what Advent is all about. And so our Advent sermon series this year is all about the return of Christ. And we're going to take a look at his second coming from four different angles. And this morning, we're going to see Jesus refute the word on the street that lightning never strikes twice in the same place. See what I mean? Turn with me in your Bibles and keep them open to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24. We're looking this morning at verses 23 through 28. Let's pray before we read. Holy Spirit, open our hearts and minds now to your word, that we might clearly understand it, that we might gratefully receive it, and that we might faithfully apply it to our lives. For Jesus' sake, amen. And now hear God's word addressed to you and me as we begin to read at verse 23 of Matthew chapter 24. This is Jesus speaking. Then if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. So if they say to you, look, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Please pray with me again. And now, Father, as my words are true to your word, may they be taken to heart. But as my words should stray from your word, May they be quickly forgotten. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the late 15th century, a German man was walking through the countryside and suddenly got caught up in a violent thunderstorm. He was knocked to the ground by a lightning bolt and terrified, he cried out to God and said, God, if you save me, I will become a monk. And the rest is history. In fact, we spent this fall celebrating the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, triggered largely by that Augustinian monk named Martin Luther. In the early 20th century, a young Scotsman was traversing the moors one night. He was pitch black. He couldn't see his hand in front of his face. And suddenly a lightning flash illumined the countryside. And he saw that he was about to take his next step over a precipice, probably to his death. He took that as a sign from God. He totally altered the path of his life, and he became a pastor. And he would go on to become the senior pastor of the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C., and at the same time serve as the chaplain to the U.S. Senate back in the 1940s. His name, Peter Marshall. Did you know that the temperature of a lightning bolt is 54,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That is five times hotter than the surface of the sun. 
Did you know that every day the earth is hit about three million times by lightning bolts? That's about 40 per second somewhere in the world. Lightning is never gradual, it's never slow, it's never hidden. It's always swift and sudden and it illuminates things. Well, this morning we find Jesus on the Mount of Olives outside the walls of old Jerusalem and he's warning his disciples then and he's warning you and me today that he will come again and when he does, it's going to be like a bolt out of the blue, like a bolt of lightning. Now, I can't think of another doctrine of the Christian faith that's more misunderstood and mistreated and twisted and, and sometimes heresified than the doctrine of the second coming of Christ. It's interesting, the Chinese communist government gets it, and so they ban the preaching of this doctrine by pastors in China. They can preach anything and everything else, but not about the return of Christ. But I find Christians, I have Christian friends who tell me, oh, I don't think that's really going to happen. I think Jesus is just being poetic. Maybe this is just metaphor. My friends, there are over 1,500 prophecies in Scripture on just the second coming of Christ alone. Eight, that's eight times more than prophecies regarding his first coming. In the Gospels, Jesus gives you and me dozens of promises saying that one day he will return. And my friends, he is the ultimate promise keeper. He never fails to keep his promises. And then this doctrine, though, is oftentimes maligned by Christians. They, I guess they're well-meaning, but they think they can predict when he's going to come back. And the centuries are littered with the carcasses of failed predictions about when Christ is going to return. In fact, Scripture tells you and me, don't ever try to do that. Jesus says, I don't even know when I'm coming back, only the Father. Don't ever try to predict when Christ is going to return. Anytime people do that, it usually leaves in the wake a bunch of heretical sects like Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons, which reminds me of the story of the priest who goes into the Pope's office and says, Holy Father, Holy Father, I've got to some good news and some bad news. And the Pope says, my son, what is it? Well, the good news, the Lord of Jesus, he has a return. And the Pope says, oh, praise be to God, I knew he would keep his promise. What's the bad news? Well, he landed at the Salt Lake City. <laughs> now, we're not to predict the return of Christ. And in this text, Jesus warns you and me that between his ascension and when he does actually return, there is going to be a slew of false Christ, false messiahs, false prophets claiming that Christ has already come back. And if you ever hear that, Jesus says to his disciples, never, ever believe it. If anybody ever comes to you uh, and they're their appearance is compelling, but they tell you Christ has returned, don't believe it. If they come to you with a convincing argument, even if it's backed up by signs and wonders, Jesus says, remember, Satan and the demonic can do miracles, don't believe it. If they have apparent great spiritual authority and clout, but tell you that Christ has returned, don't bite on their hook. If they come to you and say, Christ has returned. He's out in the wilderness. Jesus says here in our text, don't even waste your time checking it out. If they say, he's come back and he's hidden in a room somewhere, Jesus says, don't fall for that. Why? For one simple reason. That when Jesus Christ does actually return, when his feet once again touch terra firma, there will be no need nor any time for anyone to tell anyone else that Christ has returned. Because when Jesus returns, it will be with a velocity, a voltage, a power, a glory, and a majesty that will illumine the entire world and everyone will know what's going on. No one will be standing around going, whoa, what's this? Who is this all about? 
You know, Jesus Christ is the one event in human history in the light of which every other event becomes intelligible. And when he returns one day, like a bolt of lightning, that, a light, that lightning is going to illumine the world and everybody will know exactly who he is and what he's all about. And Jesus says this is going to be a time of eternal life or death. That's why he uses that rather macabre picture in verse 28 of the vulture circling the corpse. Martin Luther said that every human being falls into one or the other of two conditions. You're either dead in your sin or you're alive in Christ. He says no other options. You're either dead in your sin or alive in Christ. How do you know which one you're in? Well, look up. Look overhead. See anything circling around over your head? Hope you don't. If you do, if you're dead in your sin and not yet alive in Christ, don't panic. It can be rectified. Give me a call. We'll work on it. We'll work on that. But whatever you do, Jesus is saying here, don't ever play with lightning. When I was about nine or ten, I can still remember that I was watching a baseball game on TV, on a black and white TV. My Washington Senators were playing somebody. I don't remember. But I remember this, that in the middle of the game, a thunderstorm began to roll in. Now, the Senators' center fielder was a guy named Willie Tasby. Willie was loved by D the people in D.C. He, he was a gregarious guy. He was just a fun guy. And he was a pretty good outfielder. Anyway, the, the, a lightning bolt hit nearby and Willie in the middle of the inning takes off he, he runs from center field across the infield into the Washington dugout and refuses to come out and play he, he, he refused to come out and play the rest of the game now after the game was over which I'm sure the senators lost um, I still remember the interview with him like it was yesterday uh, the interviewer said Willie why did you run off the field why did you refuse to come back out I could see his faces. He said, I scared a lightning. I scared a lightning. Willie's a pretty smart guy. You don't play with lightning. You know, when I played ball in high school and college, uh, they didn't stop the game until somebody actually got hit by a lightning bolt. <laughs> now, my oldest son, when he played in, in high school football and baseball, they have a, now they have a lightning meter on the sideline or in the dugout. And if there's a lightning flash way off, it registers on the meter, and if it gets to a certain point, the home team's responsibility is to let the umpire or the ref know it's hit that point, and then the ref delays the game at, at that point. Uh, don't ever play with lightning. Jesus' return is sure and certain, and it will be like a bolt of lightning. And this table, my friends, this table is set this morning for those who are alive in Christ. The one who is coming back invites you and me to come and dine with him and with Christians around the world and in the church triumphant. When you and I come to this table as we wait, we're nourished. As you and I wait for his sure and certain second return or second coming, it's here at this table that you and I get as close as we possibly can to the very real presence of Christ until that day he does return in the flesh and in a flash. My friends, never eat a meal without praying first. And so let's pray right now. Join me. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Come soon. Come quickly like lightning. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.